everyone. Uh, I have a few club announcements to share uh, as we get underway, and then uh, Greg will be sharing his presentation. Is, are the lights okay? Do we we needed to turn these off? I think it's okay. That's okay. All right. So let's see if the clicker works. John, the clicker doesn't work. Yeah. Does that mean our? Add again. Okay. So um, I put out an email on this, and I hope you all received that. Is um, I'm saddened to share that TC Owens has resigned as our program chair. He's resigned off the board of directors, um, and uh, so we, the club, are certainly going to miss TC. He was crucial for our development of hybrid technology. Uh, he was our program chair. So for the last year plus, all the speakers been arranged by TC. Um, and uh, he was also a vice president of, uh, of our club. Uh, and uh, having TC's viewpoint on the board is something that we're going to deeply miss. Uh, so we're working on a thank you gift. Uh, the board is for TC, and you'll be hearing more about that uh, as we move forward. Um, I just want to remind folks that uh, the next meeting is going to be December 4. Uh, here at the Legion, you'll be able to join us, too, on Zoom. Jack Littleton is going to be talking about carp fly fishing. And Jack is uh, just a, a tremendous carp fly fisher. So uh, I encourage you to attend. He's a great speaker as well. Um, and then uh, the, the program meetings in January and February are going to be Zoom only. We're not going to meet, but because of the weather, the board has decided that um, we're, we're not going to stress about winter weather and snow and that kind of thing. Uh, but we're also going to, uh, this enables us to literally tap into any speaker on the planet. Uh, so right now, uh, we're looking for speakers for those meetings. Um, if you have some suggestions to share, please talk to me. Um, I want to also remind you that we won't be meeting on the first Monday of the month in January. January 1 happens to be a holiday. So uh, we'll be meeting a week later, Zoom only. Okay. Thinking ahead, the club is going to be taking a carpool trip to the world's largest fly fishing show in New Jersey. Um, the trip will, this is on uh, January uh, 26th through the 28th, that weekend. We'll leave Friday morning early and come back Saturday late, uh, Sunday late. And um, we've had a lot of fun going to these trips. So uh, I hope you'll be able to join that. Uh, we'll have a lot of fun. Um, I reserve a bank of hotel rooms and uh and we generally have a good time. So if you're interested, contact me. Also, uh, just to share that our fly fishing school date is now set on May 4. It'll be at the Wirtz Pond. Um, and same price as last year. So uh, you may want to uh, talk to Bill Wirtz. You can register. He'll take registrations now. Okay, a few uh, things to, uh, just on the club, and this is mainly for the folks online, is if you're new to the club and you want to learn more about us, uh, I su suggest to subscribe to the emails. Uh, just hit that QR code and subscribe. Um, we post a lot of things on our Facebook page. Um, and this QR code will link you to our Facebook page. 
not to confuse folks, we have a group and a page. The page is where all the events gets posted. Uh, also, we're taking a recording of this program along with all the other programs we've done. They live on our YouTube channel and you can find it here. That QR code will link you there to the YouTube channel and that ought to be up in the next day or so. Lastly, is um, just to sh say that if you're an FFI member, uh, thank you. And uh, to be a member of our club, all you have to do is be a member of FFI. But our club is receives no money from FFI for your membership. So everything that we do is supported by fundraising and your generosity. And so, um, especially for the folks that are joining us uh, online or maybe recorded later, um, there's a QR code to help us uh, along with the fundraising. All right, so that's it. Um, we're gonna turn our attention now to Greg Hefner. Gre I've known Greg for, I don't know, through his like decades and decades. Uh, I was a member of the Cohocton chapter of Trout Unlimited, and Greg was the longtime president of that. Uh, Greg uh, professionally was the Steuben County Planner, now retired. But Greg is a fly tying expert. I'll just use that term. He's written books. <laughs> He's written for uh, magazines. And if you go to the International Fly Tying Symposium, which is in Somerset, New Jersey, this weekend, Greg is one of the featured tires. One of the things that Greg is really knowledgeable about is what he's going to be speaking about tonight, and that is the evolution of the Eastern streamers, um, and especially uh, folks like Kerry Stevens, but a lot more. So what uh, Greg is going to be talking to us tonight, and he's going to be tying some for us, is, is he's going to talk us through the history of these streamers um, up into the current day. He's not going to be talking about the Kelly Gal puppets and things like that. These are the, the beautiful fly. No dungeons. No. Um, but... Um, Without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Greg. So I think the clicker works because John knows how to make it work, and I don't. Hi, everyone. Welcome, everyone, on Zoom land. What we want to talk about tonight are streamers. And I'm not sure why I got so interested in streamers. I know the first fly ever tied was a streamer. I got a flight tying kit when I was 12, I think. And in the little book that came with me, the, the streamer looked like the simplest one. So I'll tie one of those. So I guess that started the whole thing. So anyway, uh, I've obviously become very interested in this whole topic. Uh, I'm going to try to stay with my script because I have a tendency to just ramble. And uh, we don't want to be here all night. So I'll try not to make it sound like I'm reading, but it probably will. Okay. So introduction to the evolution of the Eastern streamer. Uh, the only reason you make the distinction is Western streamers are a little different. Streamers that, that were tied on the West Coast to fish for steelhead and salmon uh, it's just a little bit different construction, different materials. And so what we're concerned here for our purposes is here in the East, what the streamer evolved into. So. All right. So like many facets of fly fishing, streamers and streamer fishing have somewhat a cloudy past. It's hard to kind of pin down a lot of things. We know that Native Americans fished with artificial lures made of animal hairs and feathers, and undoubtedly some of them imitated bait fish. But 
that's a whole other thing. That's subsistence fishing. Uh, we're, we're more concerned with sport fishing, you know, what we do and what we've done in this country for several hundred years now. Uh, so let's, uh, let's go back a little bit and, uh, So how do we know streamers are a fairly recent addition to fly fishing? We know actually where they aren't mentioned. And I'm sure everybody's heard of the treatise, uh, Dame Juliana Berners, and uh, that's the first book that was ever written on fly fishing, although no one has ever really been able to pin down whether she ever actually existed, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, there was a book, and uh, it's generally viewed as the first known writing about fly fishing. There's 12 flies in that book, but it's very clear that none of them are what we would call streamers, long flies. They're sort of wet fly type, uh, very old wet flies. So the next one was Charles Cotton, who added a chapter, or actually a major part of the book, to uh, Isaac Walton's Complete Angler. Because Isaac Walton really didn't know hardly anything about fly fishing. Cotton, in his writings, uh, dis he discussed flies to be used in each month of the year and how to tie them. No mention of anything that represented a bait fish. So he really didn't know anything about streamers either so it was all bugs it was all bugs maybe all bugs yeah all bugs uh he did actually it's interesting he in in his uh talking about how to fish for trout he said there's there's three places you fish for trout the top the middle and the bottom the top you use a natural or artificial fly so he's thinking bugs the middle he says which is a minnow. You use a streamer in the middle. Or you use a minnow in the middle, a live minnow. A live minnow. Yes. And the bottom, which I've had a hard time figuring this out ever since I read this. The bottom, which is by hand, guess just scoop them up. Or with a cork or float, which you'd think would be on the top. But anyway, uh, he did say in the middle, you fish with minnows but he never mentioned that you could tie a fly, which looked like a minnow. He was just talking about minnows, fishing live minnows. So here's uh, kind of the two, two of the, at least two of the major writings in history about uh, fly fishing. Neither one of them mentioned anything about what we would call a streamer today. Okay. Uh, oops. Okay, so uh, moving on then to uh, some more recent writings about, I'm sure some of you have seen this book, Favorite Flies and Their Histories by Mary Orvis Marlborough. Uh, Marlboro. She uh, really tied or, or wrote the book about flies in the... Uh, middle 1800s, no mention of, of streamers. There's some really nice flies in there, but nothing that, that we would tie today and call it a streamer. Uh, okay, jump ahead about uh, 25 years. Dr. George Parker Holden's Streamcraft. This was a very popular book. And uh, in that book, he talked a lot about fly fishing, although he did talk about some other types of fishing, but mostly fly fishing. Harry Darby said that this was the book from which he learned the basics of fly tying. So obviously an important book. It has a brief mention of bass flies, which he says were made of bucktail. And he does mention Gordon's bumble puppy, which we'll talk about in a little while. Gordon, Theodore Gordon's bumble puppy. But that's, that's basically it. That was the expert uh, talking about streamers in that book. So I guess we have to look a little deeper.
Then you get to Joseph Bates. Colonel Bates was without a doubt the, the number one authority on streamers for many, many years. Would, would still be, and his books still are. Uh, he passed away in 1988. But he wrote, he wrote, and I have them up here. So after we're all finished, you can come up and take a look at these. It was interesting. He wrote actually three books. And each one built on the last one. So you'll find a lot in, the, obviously, the first one is the first one. You go to the second one, which was uh, Streamer Fly Tying and Fishing. You open it up and you'll say, well, this is the same book. Well, not really. You look a little closer and you'll find things that weren't in the first book. Also, he had a huge chapter in the back on fly patterns. And not only the pattern, how to tie it, but a history of almost every fly, who the person who had invented it, uh, what it was used for, uh, where in the country it was used. So it, it's a really neat book. This is the second one. In 1979, he wrote a third one. He called it Streamers and Bucktails, the Big Fish Flies. This one was greatly expanded. It, it, was, it was more unlike the second one than the second one was of the first one. The second one was very similar to the first one. It just had a lot more flies in it. This one expanded techniques and, and fly patterns also. It, it had almost 300 fly patterns in it of streamers. Then his daughter, 1995, Pamela Bates, she put together a revised edition of that second one. And this one is very interesting because it's, it's got some letters, some correspondence, some photography that wasn't in the, the first one. So if, if you take a look at that one, you'll see that it, it looks a lot the same. But toward the back, you'll see a lot of photography that's very good of flies and uh, just a lot more information about some of the flies that we'll talk about today. Okay, so that's just kind of a background of some of the uh, the references that you can use to learn more about streamers. And a lot of them come from the same person, okay? Okay, so this is obviously a question that probably doesn't have to be answered. You all know what a streamer is, but he defined them. So we'll look at his definitions. A fly possessing a predominantly feathered wing, this is a streamer, as he called it, whose shape and intended action is to represent, represent a bait fish. Okay? So that's a streamer. The other one, he called a bucktail. A fly possessing a predominantly haired wing, whose shape and intended action is to represent a bait fish. A fly of this type is referred to as a bucktail regardless of the type of hair. So if you, you have one that has uh, squirrel hair on it or something, it's still we still call it a bucktail. And uh, you'll hear a lot of people, obviously, you know, what are you fishing? A streamer, when actually they're fishing a bucktail. But we don't usually make that distinction. But, I mean, he was a, an academic on these, these things, so he, he made that distinction. Okay, so we got that out of the way. So the next question is, where did these things come from? Who tied the first streamers? Well, it's hard to kind of put a chronology on streamers because a lot of them kind of came about at the same time. It's kind of like, uh, you know, if, you, if you've ever studied archaeology or anything like that, where you ask an archaeologist, who invented the wheel? And they'll always tell you, well, it's really hard to say. And it was probably invented maybe three or four different places. They didn't know each other was inventing it, but that's probably what happened. Kind of the same thing with streamers. Uh, so they, they developed the same place. Now, this was Gordon's Bumble Puppy, as it was called. This is often looked on as the first streamer in this country, from Theodore Gordon. Whoops. Uh, just a little bit about the bumble puppy. Um, the many, I said, this pattern is considered the first streamer in the U.S. He mentioned it in a 1903 letter discussed. If any of you have seen John McDonald's book, uh, 
complete fly fisherman, the notes and letters of Theodore Gordon. Uh, he talks about that in this book. Roy Steenrod, who you may have heard of in the Catskills, he's a longtime fishing partner of Theodore Gordon. He said that Gordon was using this fly as early as about 1880. So uh, pretty long ago. Another contemporary of Gordon, Herman Christian, said that the bumble puppy was not really a single pattern, that it was more a general style of a fly, and that you can find uh, representatives of bumble puppies that are very different. Bodies are different, the wings different, but yet if you really look at them, you can see that they all kind of came from the, the original. So maybe Gordon started streamers. Maybe he didn't. We'll see what happens here. Another one, and you'll see that these kind of jump around because a lot of them were sort of at the same time. There's an evidence that a fly was developed by a John Hans in Fort Wayne, Indiana, which is called the Fort Wayne, Fort Wayne Bucktail. He described it in a letter to Forest and Stream magazine, which was the forerunner of Field and Stream, in about 1886. So we're going back pretty far with that, too. Then... There's uh, William Scripture. He's of Rome, New York. Records indicate that he was tying and fishing bucktails in 1907. The Scripture bucktails became well-known for taking big brown trout in the Mohawk River area. So it looks like streamers, especially bucktails, were being used early, and that New York played you know, quite a bit of a part. Okay, so that brings us to Maine. People usually think of streamers, they think of Maine. That's where it all happened. Well, let's see. If streamers first happened in Maine, it was probably because of that. Smelt. And we all know about smelt here. We used to have them, but we don't have them anymore. They all disappeared, it seems. But... Uh, Rainbow smelt really started... And actually, rainbow smelt were introduced to a lot of the lakes in Maine because they had introduced landlocked salmon. And the landlocked salmon were eating all the brook trout, which was the traditional fish that everybody was looking for in the Rangeley Lake region and in other regions of Maine. Everybody wanted to catch brook trout. Well, the brook trout were disappearing, partly because the fish and game started stocking uh, salmon. So the salmon started eating the trout. They did eventually start putting smelt into the lakes. Well, it was too late. The, the uh, salmon had pretty much wiped out the uh, brook trout. So now they had lots of smelt to eat. Okay, so if that's the case, how did it start? Well, like a lot of things, there's kind of an urban legend about how this all started. There was a guy named Alonzo Stickney Bacon, was his name. He was a guide on Grand Lake Stream, which is a river in the Rangeley Lake region. Conventional wet flies, which is what everybody fished at that time, weren't working. So, and they were in a boat. So he pulled a long hen feather out of a boat cushion, tied it to a hook, immediately started catching fish. That's often looked on as the first streamer in Maine. It was a big hen feather tied to a hook, okay? Eventually, the phrase rooster's regret started that because they're using all these hen feathers, that's the rooster's regret. So uh, they actually then started using the name rooster's regret for various fly patterns. So that was, was used. And that's my interpretation of what his fly probably looked like. That's an, an example of a later fly, the Grand Laker, which uh, they started to evolve, obviously. And this is the kind of thing that they evolved into. Did you tie that uh, off your boat cushion? Uh, no, no, I tied that off of uh, <laughs> something I had to tie flies with. I didn't want to rip my boat cushion apart. Okay. So as time goes on, mainstreamers matured. 
and led by several well-known guides, fly fishermen and fly tires. So we'll talk about a few of them. First one we'll talk about is very important, Herbie Welch or Herbert Welch. He was a very famous guide in the Rangeley Lake region. He uh, had a, actually had a shop in Haynes Landing. He was kind of a Renaissance man for his time. Uh, he was a trained artist. Some of his bronze sculptures are still in the Smithsonian. So he wasn't just a fishing guide. He was, he was an artist. He was considered the best trout taxidermist in Maine. He made some really nice mounts, which are still around today. He was also an accomplished flycaster who was in demand for demonstrations at sporting shows. And as I said before, he was a sought-after fishing guide in the Range of the Lake region. So uh, in 1902, or he told, not in 1902, he told Colonel Bates, not in 1902, he told Colonel Bates that in 1902, he had tied some uh, fancy streamers from feathers that he got from a large silver doctor salmon fly that one of his guide clients brought with him from England. Well, he was attracted to those feathers. He, the guy gave him the fly. He took the fly apart and he used that to tie something different. It didn't look like a, a silver doctor anymore, but it was more of what we would consider a streamer. Now, the thing at that time, they didn't have the large streamer hooks that we use today. He took, they did have saltwater hooks that they use like for bluefish with fairly long shanks so that you could actually take them out of the fish's mouth without getting your fingers bit off. And so he took some of those bluefish hooks and reforged them into streamer hooks. And that's what he used until he could get, eventually you could get longer shank hooks because more and more people were starting to tie these things called streamers and they wanted better hooks for it. Okay, and here's some of his flies. Uh, Welch rarebit, and it's rarebit, it's not rabbit, it's rarebit. A lot of people call it the Welch rabbit, but the actual name was rarebit. This is one of his most famous flies. It was a very popular fly in Maine. Uh, the Jane Craig was named after a very uh, popular vaudeville actress of the time, Jane Craig. So that was that one. He also tied a yellow Jane when the water was stained and the day was dark. So instead of a white one, he tied a yellow one. This one was, he admitted, was a little bit more of a fancy fly. It's called the cup septic, which was named after a minnow and a river in Maine. Uh, the Kennebago, which is another river in Maine. That was another one of his flies. As you can see, his artistic bent comes out when you look at his flies. He was very particular about his flies and made some really neat looking flies. I have some of them up here afterwards we take a look at them. Uh, this was one of his famous flies, a green spot. Uh, basically, bear hair black bear hair, and uh, green hackle. This is obviously his most famous fly, a black ghost. It's, it's in everybody's fly box, but most people don't know where it came from. They don't know who invented it. Well, it was invented by Herbert Welch. So he was, was a very important uh, figure, and we'll talk about him a little later when we talk about Terry Stevens. Another one was A.W. Below. He's considered the inventor of the marabou streamer. He liked the whole idea of the streamers that were being tied, starting to be tied, and he thought they fished well, but he wanted something with a little more action. So he decided marabou would probably have a lot more action. So he's considered the inventor of the marabou streamer. This was, was one of his you know, most well-known streamers, the Baloo Special. Joseph Stickney, uh, he's Sacco, Maine. He was a warden, game warden, supervisor. And he didn't tie his own flies, but he got other people to tie them for him. He, he told them what he wanted, what he wanted it to look like, even what materials to use, but he didn't tie. So they tied them for him. Uh, one was called the supervisor because he was a warden supervisor. Uh, that's where it comes from. That's where it comes from. 
And uh, another one was called The Warden's Worry <laughs> because he was a warden. So I'm going to make sure I don't skip over anything here, trying to go quickly. Okay, another very important tire was Bill Edson. He developed two very effective bucktails, which is very possible, might even be in some of your boxes. He had an Edson light tiger and an Edson dark tiger. That's the dark tiger. Well, as you can see, the light and the dark come from the, the uh, color of the wing, not the body. So that's the uh, light tiger, light wing, dark tiger, dark wing. These became very standard patterns. Everybody fished them. The one thing that actually I didn't have at the time that I tied these, by the way, I tied all the flies in here. So if you have any problems with the flies, you have nobody to blame but me. <laughs> uh, he used a gold metal cheek, which you'll see, I have some of his flies tied up here, instead of the jungle cock. Every now and then he put them both on, but usually instead of the jungle cock, he put these little metal cheeks on. So you can take a look at them there. Uh, when I went to tie these flies, my code didn't have any of those. So I couldn't use them later, I got some. Uh, okay, so that's the Edson Light Tiger, the Edson Dark Tiger. Another one interesting fly is uh, Dr. J. Hubert Sanborn, Waterville, Maine. He, decided, he designed a unique fly, which became very popular, named for the weight of the first landlocked salmon he caught on it. It was called a 9-3. He called a salmon that was nine pounds, three ounces. He, didn't, he hadn't, he hadn't uh, named the fly yet. So after he caught the salmon, he thought, well, we'll just call it a 9-3, because that's what I caught on it. The interesting part about this, you may have heard about flat wing streamers. This is kind of a both. It's a flat wing and an upright wing. And so it was at the time, it was a, it was a very unique fly. And uh, it was not very popular with commercial fly tires because, first of all, it's not the easiest fly to tie. But also, it's impossible to pack without squashing it because one's like this and one's like this. So commercial tires didn't like it. So you saw a lot of these tied just with uh, a, a black or a green wing with a black wing outside of it, just to get the two colors in, but not the flat and the upright. So you'll, you'll see a lot of those, but the, the correct way to tie it is that way. Okay, so these are just a few of the, there's, there's more, many more. These are just a few examples of the people in Maine who were doing, you know, what we consider what Maine was doing. They were tying streamers, and streamers were becoming popular. So that brings us to Carrie Stevens. She was born, just a little history here, born Carrie Gertrude Wills, February 22nd, 1882, in Vienna, Maine. On May 1st, 1905, she married Wallace Stevens. Sometime before 1919, they first went to the Upper Dam. Upper Dam connects Muslip and Upper, uh, Upper Chris, Upper, <laughs> yeah, Upper Richardson, yeah, I told you I shouldn't have that beer. <laughs> Upper Richardson Lake in the Rangeley region. So it's two lakes. The dam that connects those became a very famous place to fish. The spillway of that dam. And the pool, they call it a pool. It was more like rapids. But uh, it was a great place to fish. A lot of fishing went on there. And that's where Carrie Stevens and her husband Wallace lived. He was a guide. And a very became a very sought after guide. It appears that Carrie tied her first fly in 1920 at the age of 38, at the urging of Charles Shang Wheeler, which we'll talk about later. He's an important client there, client of Wallace, who we'll talk more about. What put Carrie on the map, really? 
was July 1st, 1924. She tied a fly that eventually she called the Rangely favorite. And I have one of those in here. Oh, right there it is. Uh, very simple fly, basically a gray wing with a belly of deer hair. She decided she was going to go fishing with her new fly. So she tied the fly on to her uh, line. She went right to the spillway. A lot of people at the time fished in boats in the spillway. She just fished from the shore. She ended up catching a six pound, 13 ounce brook trout with the fly. Well, she knew it was pretty good fish. So she decided she wanted, she, she went right to the upper dam club, which was close to their cottage. Upper dam house actually is what it was called. It was a, it was a fishing club and hotel. She went there. She knew they had a scale, what was considered an official scale. She weighed the fish, six pounds, 13 ounces, and she entered it into field and stream fishing contest. The magazine had a fishing contest. Well, she came in second. The winning fish was one ounce heavier than hers, but she caught the attention of the editors of field and stream. So they wrote a big article about her. Uh, newspapers in the area started interviewing her. It wasn't that long before the name Carrie Stevens was starting to become well-known. Now, at this time, she was already tying flies, obviously, because she tied this one. Uh, but it was that fish that really started the whole thing. So, And that eventually became the gray ghost. I mean, that's kind of the accrued gray ghost. It eventually, things were added to it. And it became what we know, know as the gray ghost, which was by far her most famous fly. She also began using the name Rangely Favorite Trout and Salmon Flies for her business. She was, by that time, she was in the fly business. And it all because Shang Wheeler brought some flies to her and said, well, you know, Wallace is a, is a great guy. You should tie some flies. And, she, you know, she said, well, okay, I'll try. She was a milliner. She made hats. In, in earlier years. So she was very familiar with messing with feathers. And so it would make sense that tying flies to her wasn't all that much different. Now, and I probably will mention this again, but since we're here, as far as her tying flies, she said that she never saw anyone tie a fly. She just figured out how to do it by looking at these flies that he gave her. Now, there's some little bit of controversy on that. Everybody, uh, I've read where people say, well, he gave her these flies. He said she should tie flies. He was a pretty good fly tire. You'd think he would have given her some instruction, told her a little bit about what to do, but there's really no evidence. I mean, and she always said that she had no instruction she never read a book about fly tying. She never saw anyone else tie a fly. And so, I mean, what can we, we can assume that that's true, I guess. She also didn't use a vice, which of course today is pretty standard. She tied in hand. Hold the hook yep. and, you, and you tie it. Wow. And there are, there are people today, a few people who do that. A few friends of mine who tie Atlantic salmon flies tie in hand. It's just something, it's a knack that uh, they decided they wanted to try that. And some of them are pretty good at it. At one time, that's the way salmon flies were tied. Nobody used a vice. There was actually, and I'm digressing here a little, there's actually a medical condition caused by holding the hook in your hand for so long and using it to tie flies back in the uh, early 18, middle 1800s, when everybody tied like that, there was actually a medical condition that happened in your fingers and your hand from doing that too much, which. Is that, that's, that's what happened to you, Jack. <laughs> so anyway. Uh, like I said, Carrie never saw anyone tie a fly and no one ever saw her and no one ever saw her tie one from start to finish. 
when we talk about the tying, I'll talk about her methods, which were quite unorthodox. And she she tied flies in in pieces. She would put wings together. And she'd have boxes of wings. She'd put bodies together and have bo bodies around. Then later, she'd put everything together. But she claimed no one ever saw her tie a fly from beginning to end until later. I'll, we'll get to that. <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, this probably influenced her unorthodox style of gluing wings together, and you'll see how she did that. Streamers, uh, Stephen's streamers are characterized by low wings, which partially veil the body, resulting in a very realistic bait fish look when fished. If you look in a fly catalog, and you see gray ghosts advertised. And they kind of look like this. Here's the hook, and here's the wing. Don't buy them. There. No. They got to be like this. The, the, the wing has to lay along the hook. And uh, you'll see a lot of gray ghosts, especially, because that's what everybody ties. Uh, gray ghosts that don't look anything like they're supposed to. And they don't fish like they're supposed to either. Okay, Wallace Stevens is credited with developing the technique for using flies for trolling. Before his time, that really was not a big deal. What they did, even in the, the upper dam, uh, the, the backwash and everything of, of the pool there, they would just kind of heave the fly out and let it go by itself. And... One day, he decided, you know, they weren't catching anything. And they said, well, let's move. You know, we'll just throw the flies in, and we'll just row the boat around. Well, it caught on. And that became a major way to fish uh, streamers was by trolling. And he's given the credit with coming up. You, you wouldn't think. That's one of those things he say, well, you mean nobody else thought of that before? Well, the evidence suggests that they didn't, that either they thought, well, you, you just don't do that. That's not the right way to do it or something. But he did it, and it became very popular. And it just made him even more of a, of a guide that was sought after by everybody because he caught a lot of fish. Okay, so let's take a look at some of her other streamers. And we'll talk about what makes them different uh, from one streamer to the next. Okay, everybody knows about the Grey Ghost. Her streamers kind of developed over time. Uh, she didn't immediately tie something that looked like that. Well, I showed you the one before, the Rangeley favorite, was very simple compared to the Gray Ghost. Here's one called the Merry Widow, which I should just mention. All of her flies, at least all the ones that I tied, and all the ones that are that are in most of the publications that have her flies, they all have names. But when she first started tying, she didn't name her flies. They were just numbers. And if you looked at her card, you know, she she marketed her her uh, streamers on cards with, you know, the the uh, hook was attached to the card, and it just said number on it with a blank. And then she'd write the number of the fly on there. Well, eventually, she decided she ought to name them. So she started naming her, her flies. And that kind of got interesting. I'll, I'll mention that later on. So if you notice, all this really has, it has a body and wings. There's no, and the, the jungle cock. Everybody says, boy, jungle cock must have been cheap back then. Well, she used jungle cock on every one of her flies. And it probably wasn't cheap, but it wasn't as expensive as event, at it, that it eventually became. And for a while, we couldn't even get them and get it in this country. Back then, you know, there weren't any import uh, regulations or anything like that on, on birds. So uh, she used a lot of jungle cock. But this is a, a fairly simple fly. It's just a wing and a body. Uh, you can also see about the colors. A lot of her flies, there's a bright color involved, but she mutes the color by putting another feather outside of it. 
like uh, the merry widow here is a red fly but it has blue dun feathers on the outside the red shows through but not as much as it would if if it was just red a lot of her flies are like that she kind of mutes the colors okay the jungle queen this is an example of her use of grizzly hackle produces a very realistic smolt like streamer also though this has no shoulders which by the way that's what we call the uh, feathers on the outside which we'll later talk about what they are this is again it just has a wing and a body and in this case she used grizzly feathers to give it the stripes this is an example of one of her marketing techniques really she started naming her flies after Wallace's clients. Well, I mean, who wouldn't buy a fly that was named after them? So she started doing that. Allie's favorite, Allie, was a fellow named Alfred French. So there are several Allie's flies, and they were his flies. So I'm sure he bought a lot of them because they were named after him. I should also mention at this point, before I forget, I've seen at various points in her tying career what she was charging for flies. The most recent one that I saw was in 1944. Most of her flies cost 85 cents a piece. Well, if you bring that to today, that means she was selling her flies for like 11 or $12 a piece. So they were a lot of money at that time, a lot of money. But most of the clients who were going to the Rangeley region were sort of well healed, and the money was not really an object to them. So they just bought all their flies. So that's Allie's favorite. Harry's fancy. Uh, here's an example of the addition of a shoulder. Okay, in this case, it's mallard flank. And so this has also peacock curl on top of the body which you can see coming out the back there and then the wings but it has no belly on it there's no deer hair belly on it or bucktail belly big beauty has basically the same thing but now she's added the deer hair belly bucktail other than that it's pretty much the same fly as as uh the one we just looked at, Gary's fancy. Okay, and then back to the gray ghost. And that has everything. It's got the uh, shoulders. The jungle cock is usually called the cheeks. Uh, it's got the wings. Under the wing, you can see uh, peacock curl. Also, there's golden pheasant crest under there, which kind of hard to see, but it's in there. And then... It has a throat of golden pheasant crest underneath. You can see that in front. So the gray ghost really has everything. And uh, so that was, that was always considered. Now, in the case of the gray ghost, uh, it uses silver pheasant for the cheeks, or the shoulders, sorry. She also, she used besides, now so far we've seen mallard, and we've seen uh, silver pheasant. Here she used golden pheasant tippets. This is called the Davis Special. She used uh, golden pheasant tippets on several uh, flies. This is called a red devil. This one, she had three devils. She had a red devil, a blue devil, and a white devil. They were all sort of the same fly using different combinations of wings. The shoulders on these were grouse, regular rough grouse. Next fly is uh, Kelly's, uh, there's the blue devil, and there's Kelly's killer, used Amherst pheasant body for the shoulder. The other thing on this one that's somewhat unique, is, and not unique to her flies, because she used this on quite a few, you'll notice the... Uh, she used badger hackle uh, on the outside of the wings to give it that black stripe on the wings. Usually the badger hackle is a little shorter than the main wing. 
She just decided she liked that. So uh, the Badger Hackle is usually, is, some people say, well, she didn't get that wing lined up. It's it's not the same. Well, it was, wasn't was supposed to be. It's, the Badger Hackle is always a little shorter. Okay, uh, Morning Glory uses uh, golden pheasant body. Golden pheasant has yellow body feathers and red body feathers, depending on where the bird they're coming from. This one uses a red body feather, but it has pretty much all the other elements. Okay, uh, tomahawk. This uses the green back feather from a golden pheasant. Golden pheasants are really useful for tying flies. And then we've already seen uh, mallard on Carrie's fancy and uh, wood duck. This is wood duck. So obviously Carrie's background as a milliner played into her use of variety of feathers. But part of her wide variety of patterns reflects her flair for marketing. Some of her patterns were definitely smelt imitations, while others were probably tied as attractors, sometimes to attract fishermen as much as fish. And Carrie, as I said, Carrie liked to name patterns for her friends and customers. And here are some examples of that that we've talked about before. Charles E. Wheeler, his nickname was Shang. That's what they called him. Uh, this is the Charles E. Wheeler fly. This is Shang Special, which is somewhat unique. It uses a long uh, jungle cock feather as the wing. And Shang's favorite, which uses grizzly. Obviously, Shang liked red in his fly, so all of his had red shoulders. He was, as I said before, I think, he was the one who really suggested to her that she might want to try tying flies. And then, of course, it's all history from there on. Okay, uh, real quick here. Uh, Don Bartlett was another one of her husband's uh, clients. She tied some flies named after him. This is the G. Donald Bartlett. That's the Don's special. And that's the Don's delight. So she's coming up with all these different patterns and naming them after her friends and his clients. She also had a series of uh, patterns that... Uh, were undoubtedly a sort of a patriotic series that appeared during World War II. Uh, one was called the America, and, and obviously it's, it's the colors that she used that, that made these a little different. This was the America. That's the General MacArthur, the Casablanca, the Victory, This fly, now this is the same Bates that I talked about before, who wrote the books. He, he's the expert on streamers. Well, he fished with Wallace Stevens many times. He and his wife became very good friends with Wallace and Carrie. And she, of course, came up with a fly for him. She tied a fly and called it the Colonel Bates. What was interesting is when this fly was first tied, he was a captain. So it was called the Captain Bates. Oh. That was the name of the fly. Got a promotion. Yeah. He, eventually, he got a promotion. She had to change the name of the fly. Then it was called the Major Bates. And then eventually, he was promoted to Colonel, and it became the Colonel Bates. So it was the same fly, three different names. Uh, so that was quite interesting. And then finally, just one more example. Uh, the Lakewood was a very famous camp in the Rangeley region uh, for sports to go and, and fish there. She tied this one called the Lakewood. Larry Parsons was the owner of Lakewood camps for 30 years. This was Larry's special. She named it after him, and that was the Larry. So there were three flies that came from that camp named after that camp and and the owner. Okay, so there's a sampling of some of Carrie Stevens' patterns and some of the history. As you would expect, her style has been used to create numerous other patterns, many simply modifications of the originals. 
There are ghosts in just about every color you can imagine. Using her style and techniques, you can create patterns based on desired colors, water conditions, etc. There's even one that imitates local bait fish, tied by some guy from Bath. So <laughs> there's that one. Okay, in 1949, Wallace's advancing age and Carrie's health problems. She had health problems for a long time, but no one seems to know really what was wrong with her. I've read uh, that she had uh, pains in her hands. Uh, she had, was fatigued a lot. She had a uh, swollen gland, which it said swollen gland. I often wonder if she had a thyroid problem. Mm. I don't know. But anyway, and Wallace was uh, 14 years older than her. So in 1949, they decided it was time to sell their cottage at Upper Dam. So they sold the cottage. They moved into a town. She continued tying until 1953 and sold her business to an H. Wendell Falcons. He was from Tamworth, New Hampshire. Supposedly, he became the first person who ever saw Carrie tie a fly from beginning to end. Very first. At least that was what she said, that no one had ever seen her tie from beginning to end. She knew they saw her put the pieces together, but not the whole fly. So this was the fly that she tied, the pink lady. She tied that step by step, explaining to him exactly how she tied it. And that became the last, probably the last fly she ever tied was the pink lady. And then very briefly here, following a campaign by many of Carrie's friends, the governor of Maine declared August 15th, 1970 to be Carrie Gertrude Stevens Day, the only fly tire to ever be officially recognized by the state. Unfortunately, Carrie never knew this honor as she died in a nursing home on August 3rd. So she never knew about this honor. But uh, she obviously left an indelible mark on flies and fly fishing, especially the art of the streamer. And since then, I mean, her streamers have always been looked on as just a step above everybody else's. And uh, you know that also, if you ever come across one and you want to buy it, <laughs> you'll know that it's held above everyone else's. Uh, most of her streamers today are either in the Rangeley Museum or in private collections. You very seldom see any offered for sale. And if they are, and you're literally talking $400, $500 for one fly, because they just aren't around anymore. So if, if you ever find one, make sure you get it, you get it. Assuming you don't, you know, you don't have to pay $500 for it. If you ever find one in an auction and somebody wants to sell it to you for a dollar, buy it. Okay. So that's Carrie Stevens. Quite the lady and a tough act to follow, but there are others and we'll go over them real quick. What time we got here? 7.30. I want to leave time to tie a fly here. Lou Oatman. I don't know if you ever heard of Lou Oatman. Lou was uh, from Shushin, New York. He was a professional fly tire and a, a very good fisherman, very skilled fisherman. He said he looked for patterns to imitate the forage fish in the waters he fished. But other than the patterns in Maine try, that tried to imitate smelt, he really couldn't find any for the, the, you know, the food that was in the streams that he was fishing. Just couldn't find. So he invented his own. For example, he looked at a golden shiner and he said, all right, what, what in that would, a, would stand out to a fish? And he designed flies based on that idea. In the case of the Golden Shiner, that was his Golden Shiner. Dark top, yellow, light middle, uh, the uh, light on the body, and the red for gills. So that was his Golden Shiner. Now, obviously, that's somewhat imitative. It doesn't, you know, 
you could uh, today, you could take some of Enrico Puglisi's material and you could make a golden shiner that looks exactly like a golden shiner. But back then, that wasn't available. Or he probably would have done it. Uh, Redfin Shiner was, was another one that he, uh, he tied, uh, tried to imitate the Redfin Shiner. You'll notice he used badger hackle in the wing. A lot of his flies use badger hackle. They have that black stripe. Uh, golden smell, also badger hackle. The male, or the bat and kill shiner, which obviously is an imitation of the shiner's common to the bat. He fished the bat and kill a lot. That was one of his home streams. Uh, male dace, you all know what a black nosed dace is. That was his, uh, his imitation of a male black nosed dace during spawning. Uh, silver darter, which is one of his more famous flies. Gray smelt. Uh, cut lips, which was a pattern that imitates the cut lips minnow, a dark bait fish found in the Osable and the Batten Kill, as well as other trout streams. Uh, yellow perch. He was also a bass fisherman, and uh, he developed this one to fish for largemouth bass. He called this one the trout perch, which he actually he said he he tied this to catch what he called pike perch which really were walleyes. At oh. that time, they were called, up in his neck of the woods, I guess they called them pike perch. And this is one of his really neat flies called uh, a brook trout. And of course, the, uh, the dots on the wing are painted on there. You're not going to find a feather that has, has those dots on it. And then finally, he uh, had one that Dr. Oatman, his father was a doctor. So he tied this one in honor of his, of his father. So that's Lou Oatman. Very important, uh, especially in, in northern New York. Uh, probably a lot more people up there know him than in other places. Sam Slaymaker. We'll just, and we're only doing a few here. So he's from Gap, Pennsylvania. He was interested in, again, the colors of the bait fish. And he actually had some put in prisms so that the light would refract and he could see the light that he thought the fish probably saw reflecting off of these bait fish. He was, uh, if you ever, you might have seen the Slaymaker Lock, big lock company. Mm -hmm. Well, he was one of the Slaymakers. He was oh. in the lock family. Uh, he was introduced to fly fishing at the age of 12 by Charlie Fox, who I'm sure you've heard of, down in uh, on the Yellow Breaches. He fished with Vince Marinaro and uh, some of the boys down there. During World War II, he was a radio man gunner who flew 21 missions over Germany. After the war, he studied history at Cambridge. He returned home in 1947 and resumed his interest in fly fishing. He eventually became a well-known outdoor writer and a strong proponent for fly fishing as a conservation tool. Uh, he wrote two books. One of which isn't coming up. But anyway, uh, he, his first one was called Simplified Fly Fishing. He tried to convince the non-fly fisher that they should try fly fishing because he felt that fly fishing was a conservation tool that it didn't hurt fish as much as bait fishing. So he thought more people should be fly fishing. So he, tied, he wrote a book to try to help them to learn as simply as possible how to fly fish. Then he also wrote this one, tie a fly, catch a trout. Here he promoted fly tying as a way to make the sport of fly fishing even more interesting. He uh, described the development of three streamer patterns for which he was to become very well known. And I'm sure some of these you probably have in your box or you have. The little brown trout. That was one of his. That's the first one. And he, this one, he was capitalizing on the fact that brown trout like to eat little brown trout. <laughs> so he came up with a little brown trout fly. And it, it very effective. It was so effective, as a matter of fact, it became so popular that he came up with two more. The little brook trout and the little rainbow trout. 
He did say, though, that the last two never really became as popular as the brown trout. And there, that's another fly that you open up, a, a, a if it's an extensive at all, uh, fly guide or uh, catalog today, you'll probably see a little brown trout streamer in there. Okay, so we've looked at two fly tires who were interested in developing flies that accurately imitated bait fish. There's another we can't overlook. That's Art Flick. I'm sure some of you know a little bit about Art Flick. Uh, his, his wife, actually, after Art died, she lived in Corning for many years. She was also selling his flies, if, if you could get them before she sold them all. And they weren't cheap either, but uh, she, she was smart. <clears throat> He became famous doing like a year of not fishing and we're, you know, learning about the bugs. He, he literally took a whole year off and he didn't fish at all. And he wrote his book. Now this is the new Streamside Guide. The original was published in 1947, just called Art Flick Streamside Guide. This one was published in, I think, 1966. I have it, 69. And Obviously, it's about insects, but part of it talks about streamers and like five pages of it. The rest of the book's about bugs. But what he concludes is that, well, all you really need is you just have to imitate them because there's more of them in streams than anything else. Black-nosed dace. So he came up with his black-nosed dace streamer, which today is still a very popular streamer. He liked to tie it. Uh, the white, he liked to use polar bear. The black stripe in the middle, he liked to use skunk, the black black skunk hair, and the top, brown uh, bucktail. Today, we usually just tie it with three different colors of bucktail. But uh, he liked to use the other ones. So that's Art Flick. So in Lou Oatman, Sam Slay, Slaymaker, and Art Flick, we looked at the development of streamers to accurately imitate the bait fish, trout, and game fish feed on. As we know, there have been many fly streamers included that have been successful not because they imitate anything in nature specifically, but they just look like something good to eat. Or at least to make a fish mad enough, they want to kill it. Uh, and we call these attractor patterns. I'm, I'm just going to mention one as an example, and this is probably one of the most well-known uh, tractor patterns of Mickey Finn. Uh, you know, at one time, you look at anybody's fly box, they'd have some Mickey Finns in there. It was popularized by John Alden Knight. Those of us old enough that remember when the salooner tables were in the in the newspaper, and it told you by the moon and the stars when you should be fishing. That was him, John Alden Knight. He lived when he when he was doing those. He was in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. That's where he lived most of his life after that. Uh, but he's he's often given credit with inventing the Mickey Finn. Well, he didn't, and he never said he did. Uh, he was introduced to the streamer in 1932 when he lived in Rye, New York, when it was just called the Red and Yellow Bucktail. He took the fly with him on a trip to Toronto, Canada, and used it to catch 75 brook trout in one day. The fly was renamed the Assassin by one of his fishing partners, Gregory Cly uh, Clark, a writer for the Toronto Star. A few days later, Clark renamed it the Mickey Finn, after reading an article in Esquire magazine about how Rudolph Valentino had been killed by Mickey Finns, given to him by the wait staff in New York and Hollywood. Obviously not big fans. So uh, in 1937, Knight had, had an article published in Hunting and Fishing magazine about the streamer. And the magazine came out at the same time as the big sportsman show in New York City, which obviously we don't have anymore, but that was... That, that Schwartzman show and the Boston Schwartzman show were like the shows at that time. Big shows. The Weber Tackle Company began turning out as many Mickey Finns as they could. 
And there was supposedly one small fly company in Westchester, New York, that saved itself from bankruptcy by specializing in Mickey Fizz. They became really popular. And to this day, it's it's definitely a go-to fly for some of the more traditional fly fishermen. It's also a good example of how one fly can be tied in several styles. According to uh, Knight, a featherwing version, what became more popular in Canada than the hair wing version. For some reason, they like the, the feather wing version better. So there's a brief look at how the traditional Eastern streamer developed. Obviously, time marches on. Have we had any recent innovations that will join the classic streamers? When someone does this presentation 50 years from now, what would be added? What do you think would be added? Have any thoughts? If I had to guess, I'd say that the most likely candidate to add to the list is that. Yes. Without a doubt. Yes. That has revolutionized streamer fishing. And I can't think of any fly that, that has had more impact, freshwater and saltwater, than a clouser. I still have, in my files, I have a copy of the article from flight, uh, American Angler and Flight Tire, which is probably from 1979 or 80. It was soon after Bob invented the clouser. And it was an article written by Lefty Cray in which he's espousing how great this fly is and how many different species of fish he has already caught on this, like 55 different species of fish up to that point that he caught on a clouser. By now, there have been lots more fish caught on a clouser as far as species. But uh, yeah, there's there's no question that, like I say, 50 years from now, somebody's giving us a, a uh, talk on traditional streamers, heritage streamers, that's got to be one of them. Another one might be a lefty's deceiver. Uh, used everywhere, started out as a saltwater. He, he started it to fish for stripers in the Chesapeake Bay, but eventually it just went everywhere. And uh, everybody knows what a deceiver is. So there's no question, uh, you know, these are two candidates. Now, uh, it might be that, uh, you know, something like that's going to take over. Uh, completely synthetic, no question they work, and they don't fall apart much. They, they're very strong flies. But uh, I would say uh, there's still something about tying a gray ghost and catching a fish with it that puts you firmly in the traditions of fly fishing. I, without a doubt. So that's pretty much the end. I talked about these books. That's a good book, Dick Stewart and Bob Lehman, uh, Trolling Flies for Trout and Salmon. That's another one of those books that, uh, it's a great book, but try to find one. They're, they're tough to find. Uh, this was a good book. Uh, Dave Klausmeyer, who's the editor of uh, Flight Tire Magazine, he wrote this quite a few years ago, and it's, it's a good book. Uh, we, talk, we said that the smelt were kind of the target. Uh, lots of mainstreamers were to imitate smelt. Here's a whole book of smelt patterns, and there's a lot in there. It's a, it's a good book, Don Wilson. And you may have seen this book, Forgotten Flies. Excellent book. It has a whole chapter on Kerry Stevens. It also has a chapter on Ray Bergman and Charles DeFeo and a couple others. Uh, that's an excellent book. Again, uh, if you can find one, you'll probably pay four or $500 for it now. That's, that's how much they've, they've gone up. So uh, there are the references. Those are all the books I just talked about. If anybody you know, wants to write any of that down. And that's it. Hope that wasn't too long. So we're, we're going to switch to tying. By the way, we have like about eight folks that are joining us online. So good, good. Um, 
we'll, we'll go into the tying and then questions. Sure. Yeah. Cool. I mean, I can take some questions now if there's any questions while I'm getting set up here. Any anybody uh, have questions that are online? Just uh, go off and mute or uh, or type it in chat. I have a question. You mentioned the use of polar bear hair, mm -hmm. which is you can still get it, but it's crazy expensive. Yeah. Where have you found that's closest to it? The closest to polar bear. Polar bear is kind of one. It's kind of like jungle cock. There is nothing really like polar bear. It's there's just something about polar bear that shines. It's yeah, it's just a, a great material. Uh, a lot of flies that use polar bear now use bucktail. Uh, the other thing that I want to, I might as well talk about it now. Uh, Harry liked to use goat hair for the bellies if she could get it. Uh, obviously, bucktail is a very common material in Maine, so she had plenty of that. But if she could get goat hair, she liked goat hair. And goat hair is thinner than bucktail. It doesn't have the buoyancy of bucktail. So one of the things that you can go wrong in tying these streamers, I'll put this one back in here. If you put too much hair on the belly, you're going to flip it over It'll because the hair will float, or at least it'll go on the side. But depending on how much hair you put in, it'll flip it over. So you don't want to put a whole lot of hair in there so that it, it rides the way it's supposed to. So the goat hair is better because it doesn't float like deer hair does. It's not near as buoyant. Okay. Uh, sorry, yes. I started to yeah, sure. a comment. Absolutely. It's sort of interesting. Uh, for me, I think you said you were 12 when you started tying. I was maybe 14. I brought a little kit from a guy named Wally Allen. I knew Wally. Wally. Did yep. you have to know Wally? I knew Wally well, somewhat. I yep. Wally, I talked Wally into like had a little money from mowing lawns. My dad and mother never gave us anything. So I went to his fly shop and I asked him if I, I'd buy that kit. It was in a little cardboard box. I got this from the antique boy shit. Yeah. And I said, would you give me a lesson? I'll buy it if you give me a lesson. I won't buy it. But I was a hard bargainer at maybe 14. <laughs> so he... He did. He showed me how to tie one fly. The rest of it I learned on my own. Mm -hmm. But Wally, if I'm correct, and I'm sure you'll know, designed a fly called the woodchuck. Absolutely. And the woodchuck was, a, uh, I think, a spelt pattern. Mm -hmm. It was told in Cuba and sent yep. it on a fly rod. Yep. And it was famous, and he sold those. And uh, I have a little catalog. I haven't found it yet, but I also worked with Engel Sarand. Uh, I won't tell you how many years, right? Yeah. But anyway, I met a, a guy there who was working beside me, and his his name, last name was Fleck. Oh, yeah? And I said, you know, I, I, and I'm a fly dyer, and I said, I got a book that was written by Art Flick. Yeah, he said, that's my dad. That's my dad, yep. So, uh, you know, we're talking. I haven't seen to have any interest in thinking about the dad. But I yeah. thought that was interesting, the evolution of flies. And uh, I, I never fished a lot of streamers, but I will say I've had better luck on that uh, Flowers are mineral than any stream I've ever been. Yeah. It, so thanks for listening to an old man. Oh, no. <laughs> the woodchuck, I always thought the woodchuck was absolutely the best fly that anybody that lived more than 50 miles from Cayuga Lake and uh, Seneca Lake and Cuca Lake wouldn't know anything about. And it, 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 it never got out of this area. But it was it was the fly okay. here, and, it, and and I never fished it, but I know about it. I I fished it a few times. I tied more than I fished. Uh, I okay. tied quite a few because they have got our quick book. 
Yeah. So I've yeah. got the original copy, not the new one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Art Flick Jr. I, I knew him a little bit. He was a member out at the Bath Rod and Gun Club. Oh, I'll bet. He really wasn't interested in, in fly fishing. No. He fished, fished the lake. But he was, uh, you know, like a uh, Seth Green rig fishing, mm -hmm. pulling wire, or uh, he, he just wasn't wasn't interested in fly fishing. Even though his father, you know, was uh, <laughs> was well known. <laughs> Small world. Yeah, it is. All right, we'll kind of throw one together here. I want to show you just a little bit about. Carrie Stevens' techniques. Uh, she tied flies the way no one else tied them. Uh, and her flies were well known for being strong, not falling apart. Uh, but there was more to it. What she did, she glued her flies together. And the way she did that, whoops. Uh, and even before that, the bodies that she made, she used uh, floss, usually silk. Later on, she used rayon, too, because rayon by that time was fairly well known. And it was a good silk substitute. But most of her flies were made with silk. Uh, her tinsel, of course, she would have been using a real metal tinsel which is can be a real pain to tie with, cuts your thread. I mean, and then after you, you can get it on, if it doesn't cut your thread, uh, it tarnishes, you know, it rusts. I mean, some, it messes the fly up sometimes. So Mylar was a really good invention, which, of course, she didn't have, but uh, she was using regular metal. The other thing, and I don't want to dwell on this too much, but... One thing that I noticed really a long time ago, and I never saw anybody write anything about it. I never heard anybody talk about it. When you wrap tinsel, if you're a right-handed tire, you're wrapped this way. I noticed right away that her flies, the tinsel was wrapped this way, was counter-wrapped. And you could tell that by the way it was slanted. Instead of being slanted this way, it was slanted this way. So the only thing, I knew she didn't tie with a vice. So I thought, well, either she counter wraps her tinsel or she wraps left-handed. And I never could find a picture of her that showed which hand she was holding the fly in. All the all the pictures of her, she was fooling with feathers and stuff like that. But I've never seen a picture of her when she was actually tying a fly, holding the... But Sharon Wright, who wrote that one book over there that I have a couple flies in, she said that uh, she saw a picture of her one time that it was very clear that she was holding the hook in her left hand and tying with her right hand. So she must have counter-wrapped her tinsel, which would make the body a little stronger because you wrap the, if you wrap the, the uh, silk this way and then you counter-wrap the tinsel, you're making it stronger. So uh, evidently, that's what she did. She counter-wrapped it. The other thing she did is she coated her bodies with first with, uh, yeah, <laughs> shellac. Thank you. Shellac. <laughs> and the reason she did that was to lock in the color. But you couldn't just use shellac because if if you've ever seen what happens to shellac, if it gets wet, yeah. it gets all milky and you and you can't can't look through it. I mean, it would mess up the whole fly. So she covered her bodies with shellac. After the shellac was all dry, then she covered them with either lacquer or varnish. And that sealed in the shellac. Mm -hmm. So just another example of how she made any money. Of course, what she charged for her flies, she was probably making money. But no one 
since her would even try to sell streamers like she tied the way she tied them. He'd go broke. He, he couldn't do that because it would just take too long. And uh, that was one of the comments that Wendell Falcons, who bought her business, in a letter that I saw, he told Joe Bates, who wrote the books, his opinion was, I don't know how she made any money. Mm. It's too takes too long to tie these flies. So I'm sure he came up with some uh, shortcuts. And the one, if you want to see some of his flies that he tied, and they're her patterns that he tied in the probably the uh, mid fifties. Uh, the book there, uh, Trolling Flies, has a lot of flies in it. And if you look, each fly says who tied it. A lot of them were tied by Wendell Falcons. So you can see what Gary Stevens flies looked like tied by the guy that she sold her business to. It's very interesting. All right, let's get moving here. There's beer to have here. That's what she had to do with the stages. Exactly. It had to dry. Everything she was doing had to dry. So, all right. So I put, I already did the bodies just to, I told Kurt, you know, I, I made some bodies. Uh, watching somebody wrap floss around a hook is kind of like watching paint dry. <laughs> There's no need for it. So I did those already. So, what we're going to do is just do the rest of the fly. And the first thing that goes on. What, what is the hook? I mean, oh, okay. This hook is a size one, a British size one, 8X long. So, yeah, come on up. So it's a, it's a big hook. Actually, we tie her flies today on these big hooks because most of the flies are for presentation. I mean, they're not going to be fished. Most of her flies were tied on twos, fours, and sixes. She tied some as low as sixes. But even a, a size six, six or eight X, is a pretty long hook. Mm. So she coated the body, let it dry. The next thing that goes on... is the peacock curl and either the uh, bucktail or bucktail or the uh, goat. In this case, we're going to use bucktail. So which fly are you tying? Uh, actually, I'm tying, I guess you could call it a, a red ghost. I wanted to tie something that you could see. So I'm using red, a gray ghost, it's kind of hard to see. Uh, okay. So we'll, we'll, we'll call it a red ghost. My, my friend who passed away not too long ago, which some of you may have come across at shows, Mike Martinek, uh, he has a, had a pattern called Mike's Red Ghost Special. So it was basically a red ghost with a couple little different things going on. Did he do a video? Yeah, he had several videos, yeah. Interesting guy. He, he, I mean, he was basically the guy that taught me how to tie these streamers. And he learned to tie them to a large extent from Austin Hogan, who was the first executive director of the, actually he, he had a lot to do with starting it, the American Museum of Fly Fishing in Manchester, Vermont. And Mike got hooked up with him at United Flight Tires, which was a long-standing uh, fly tying organization in Boston. Now, for the sake of, still, no. okay. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> for the sake of time, I usually don't do this. I I kind of hand stack, but we'll we'll use this. We'll cheat a little. Okay. Just. Uh, move things along and you don't want this to look like it was chopped off. So sometimes I even stagger them a little bit. All 
Okay, so that, that's enough. You don't want to, like I said, you don't want a whole lot. So we'll just put that, that this goes, the hair, actually everything goes a little past the bend of the hook, except the wings, they go a little further. If you look at her flies, none of her wings are more than about a half an inch past the hook bend. The whole reason being, that's why you're using a long shank hook. So the fish don't miss it. And that's why they started going to long shank hooks because at one time, and you'll see if you look at some of the flies I tied there, Herbie Welch's flies, the wing is much longer than the hook. And the salmon that they were fishing for, landlocked salmon, have a tendency to nip at the back of a fly. They don't inhale it. And so there were a lot of missed strikes. So they started using long shank hooks because they got more, more takes. So we'll just put that right on there like that. It's pretty slippery. Now the trick with bucktail is you want to make sure that you don't let it flare. Well, the only way you can not make it flare is once you tie it in, you take a few loose wraps back. That puts it right up against the body. Okay, a few strays here. You got some mortals that are going to take yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. half an hour yeah. to do that. Oh, a little bit. This great stuff. I don't know if you ever ever tried this. Sally Hansen Mega Shine. It's not it's not Sally Hansen hard as nails, which I use for a lot of things. That's what the glue is that we're going to glue the wings together with. I just take a Sally Hansen hard as nails, open it up, and let it sit overnight like that. It starts to thicken, which you can't glue the wings together with head cement. It's too thin. So you need something thicker. Okay, so there's that. Next thing is the peacock curl. Now, her flies, this is another one of those anomalies that uh, you see some of her flies where the peacock curl is tied underneath. It's tied before you tie the deer hair. So right below the body is the uh, peacock, and then below that is the white uh, bucktail. I don't think anybody really knows why she went from one to the other, because it seems like it wasn't even kind of a time thing. If you tried to figure out when she tied the fly, oh, well, well, she tied that one later on because the, the uh, peacock was on the top or the peacock was on the bottom, whichever one. It, it really didn't work that way because uh, you'd see some of her flies that you knew were earlier flies and the peacock may have been on the bottom. Then you'd see other flies that were of the same era and the peacock's on the top. So who knows? The only thing we really know about her tying are letters that she sent to Joe Bates, the letters that she sent to Wendell Falcons when he bought her business, I mean, most of it, there's not a whole, there's nobody to ask. And uh, so all we can do is kind of see what we can gather from what we can find. Okay, so there's that. So now that is on.
and everything is tapered toward the uh, toward the front, so that when you get to the front, you don't have a big bulge there. She glued in the. You're using the nail polish again. Yep. Mega shine. Mega shine. The only reason I, I use this. Everybody heading to Walmart tomorrow. Well, the problem with this is that it's not as cheap as Sally. Sally Anson hard as nails is a couple dollars. Last time I bought some of this, it was like, I don't know, $7 or something like that. Oh, file for one of these. <laughs> Which compared to the, you know, the other one. I mean, even uh, head cement, real head cement, sometimes doesn't cost $7 a bottom. Okay, so. We have that on. The next thing on a ghost would be the uh, golden pheasant. And that just lays right on top. Is that available, pretty readily available to golden pheasant? Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, I mean, it's like a lot of things. Getting good stuff sometimes isn't that easy. Just getting it. And you can uh, you can get it from a lot of supply houses. So I just want to make that a little straighter. And that just goes right on there. And that goes to the end, just overlaps a little bit the end of the Peacock, just like that. Now, did you do anything to that golden pheasant before? Because I've always had a hell of a time getting those things to lay right. Well, like that's kind of what I just said. Is the trick is getting good stuff. And sometimes I like sometimes I can't find. Sometimes I steam them. Sometimes, I mean, you can you can manipulate them yourself. Like this would be a good one for the topping on an Atlantic salmon fly. Right. Perfect. On here, you need something a little straighter. Right. So one way you can maybe do that is just take your thumbnail, and go along here, and it'll straighten out. Okay. Now it, it looks a little different because now more of it is is down, but you won't see that. That'll lay right over that, uh, and that would work just as good as the one that I put on there. So yeah, you just have to mess with these things. Okay, so pretty much ready to go. Next thing is to put on the wing. Now we're going to use, like I say, the red so that it shows up a little better. Now, like I said, Carrie glued her wings together and she made lots of pairs of wings at a time and then went back and used them later on to tie the flies. So first thing you have to do, of course, is to get the right length. Certainly much too long, so we'll pretty good. Now, the easiest way to do this is if you can just put these on top of each other. Put them side by side. That's going to be the wing. And you can see that some of them are a little too long yet. How many feathers do you have? Four. Four, you use four? Yeah, two on each side. So those two are glued together. 
No, they aren't yet. Okay. I'll show I'll, I'll show you how that works. I'm just getting the right length. Might just be a little too long. Mm -hmm. So so you've got the four feathers for the wing, right and left, two right, two left. You're getting the length right. There we go. Okay. The next thing we need are the shoulders. And I think I got two up here somewhere. The silver pheasant. Make sure it's the right size. The shoulders are generally about one third of the wing. So that's the first third. That's the second one. That one's pretty good. So I think we can make these work. Okay, so everything's ready now. So I keep hitting that with my sleeve. <laughs> it's my sleeve keeps hitting it. Okay, so what we're going to do is take some of this uh, Sally Hansen, which is very thick. And that's what you need to glue. You can't use, like I said, you can't use head cement. It's too thin. So that was Sally Hansen. That's that's regular Sally Hansen hard as nails. And I just open it up, let it sit overnight, and it'll start to get hard. Yeah, it's been, it'll get viscous. Right, it won't get hard. It'll start to get viscous, yeah. Okay, so make sure we get the right ones here. So what you want to do is take these feathers, take a little of this, and you want to put this right on the spine. Now you are going to have the shoulder on there, and you're going to have the jungle cock. So it doesn't matter if you can see a little glue because the glue is going to be covered. Let's put it together. So the best we know is Carrie uh, glued hers together? Oh, yes, definitely. But yeah. didn't use Sally Hansen. I doubt it. <laughs> I don't think Sally Sally was in business then yet. But yeah, she definitely glued them together. It's funny. I mean, today, as soon as you start talking about glue and fly tying, oh, yeah. everybody thinks, oh, you're cheating. You know, especially like if you're tying Atlantic salmon flies, mm. like Charlie Shoot. I'm sure you've seen Charlie at shows. Have you ever seen Charlie Shoot tie salmon flies? He's in another world. He's he excellent. He is in another world. But he totally abhors using glues of any kind, anything. He he waxes his thread. I mean, everybody waxes the thread. But uh, using uh, glue is a taboo with Charlie. But with these flies, this is the way she tied them. So... I don't have a problem with using glue on these because she if it's good enough for her, it's good enough for me. Yeah. So the wings are glued. And it doesn't hurt just to let them sit for 15 seconds. So now we're going to put the uh, shoulders on. Same idea.
Hello? Mark. Did you have to pre-cut those shoulders to shape? No. Okay, well, they're... all I, I I didn't cut them this way. I didn't make the shape. I just took the feather and looked for a feather that I thought would be a good shape. And like this may have been a bigger feather. And I just took off the bottom until I got to what I wanted. Okay. But I didn't trim the outside of the feather. And I didn't put enough glue on there. It was very interesting. This one just doesn't want to stay together. The Hilliards who wrote the Carrie Stevens book, they had uh, an article soon after they wrote the book, actually. It was, it was actually an excerpt from the book, but there was something in this article that wasn't in the book. It was uh, from uh, the American Fly Fisher, which is the journal of the American Museum of Fly Fishing, quarterly. They had taken a blue devil, one of her flies, and they decided they were going to take it apart, one step at a time to see exactly how she did it. So they did. I mean, they painstakingly took the thread off, eventually took one of the wings off, took one of the other wings off. They just kept taking the fly apart and photographing each step. They had found a couple things that they thought were interesting, that, for example, the wings were on were put on separately. She put one wing on, a couple wraps, put the other wing on, a couple wraps, and then made sure that they were on there, and then more wraps. Now, keep in mind, she was doing all this without a, a vise and without a bobbin. She just had a piece of thread. She didn't use bobbin either. Wow. <laughs> so that was their conclusion, that the uh, wings were put on separately. Sharon Wright, who wrote that other book over there, she did the same thing. Years later, she took, and ironically enough, it was the same fly, the blue devil, that she took apart too. Not the same one, but same pattern. And in taking that one apart, she found that both wings were put on by the same turns of thread. So her only conclusion was they were put on at the same time. Well, so right there were two different conclusions based on taking some of Carrie's of uh, a fly apart. And who knows? Again, that may have been one of those things that sometimes sometimes she did one way, sometimes she did another way. But uh, it definitely and and I, I reread both of them several times, and there's no question that they came to different conclusions. So, I mean, you know, things, things like that are, are very interesting, but uh, who knows? All right. So we got to make sure that we've got the right wings here. And this is the left wing. That's the right wing. Okay. Oop.
Oh, now we switch out. She she also tied all her flies with white thread so that the colors of the thread and the uh, floss wouldn't, the, the thread wouldn't affect the color of the floss when it got wet. So all the fly was tied with white thread until she got to the head. And then she put the head on. It was where her heads were black. No, actually, uh, and I'll talk about that. Her trademark on her flies was a stripe, usually in the middle of the head, either a red stripe, an orange stripe, a yellow stripe, a gold stripe. There were all different colors that she used. A lot of them that you see are red and orange. And some of them are at the front of the head or the back of the head where the, near the feathers. Some are at the front of the head near the eye of the hook. Most of them are in the middle. That was her trademark. She said that she did that so that everybody would know that this was a quality fly that she had tied and she was standing behind her product. So then that brings up the question, well, those of us who tie her flies today, should we do that? Mm -hmm. Well, most of us that tie her flies agree that no, we shouldn't. That was her trademark. We're tying her patterns, which are great, but we shouldn't be tying that trademark on there because that was hers. Every now and then you, you'll see some that are, they, they have more. Well, that's personal opinion, I guess. But uh, I, I never do that. And several of my streamer tying friends never do that. So let's see if we can get these on here. One. Now, you'll notice right away, I'm not tying them on together on top. That's the way a lot of Eastern streamers are tied. You put the feathers together, you sit them on top, and you tie them down. Her wings were put on at like 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock. And it made for a totally different looking fly. So we'll put this one on, see if we can do this halfway decent down up there. Okay, so now they're both on there. All we have to do is squeeze a little bit. Oop, see, one of them rolled on us. Oh, we got to take that out. What size deepest thread are you using? This is uh, 14 aught, I think. So it's pretty small. I think it's 14, yeah. That's kind of a holdover from when I tie salmon flies because we want those tiny little heads on salmon flies. You can always make it bigger, you can't make it small. That's right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Okay, the only thing left to do, I still don't really like this wing, but it'll work. Let's put the jungle cock on. You want to hold that up there for a minute? There we go. Now, one of the things that, that I do differently, because it's the way Mike Martinek did it, and he taught me how to tie these things. Uh, it looks like when, when Carrie tied them, she put the jungle cock right on those wing pieces that she was putting together and putting in a box. It already had the jungle cock on it. We usually 
tie the, the wing, put it on, and then add the jungle cock last. Just seems to work. I mean, it all works, but uh, it's just what I've gotten used to. There's one. Which way is that curve? It's curved that way. Oops. This is this is neighbors has a have John Yeah. This is this is very nice, John. That is really nice. Where do you find it? I bought that last year at the International Flight Tire. Oh yeah. The guy next to me was was selling it. Joe Cordero. Mike Hogue has some now. Yeah, Mike usually has some. And that's the kind of thing where it's just a matter of how much do you want to pay for it? <laughs> The thing is, you can you can basically fix jungle cock. You don't have to buy whatever I paid for that. Uh, even the split ones that are all split, you can fix those basically by putting some glue on. My glue go. No, no good. Need more. Put some glue on and just fix it. Now, are you gluing this to fix it, or are you, you gluing that? Oh no, this didn't need fixing. Uh, you glue it to the glue it to the shoulder. Yeah, when I said fix one, I meant if they were bad, yeah, you can no, fix I, them. I, but you I, glue them regardless. You glue them regardless. Instead of cool. But you can't glue them if you if you see like hair wing flies that have jungle cock on you can't glue to hair it just becomes a mess you can only glue to feathers glue jungle cock to feathers
burning. And that's that. That's beautiful. Yeah, it really is. Oh. This one's actually nicer. So, as you can see, it's it's not a commercial fly tires uh, cup of tea because it, they just take so long to tie. And uh, that's one of the reasons I'm sure why she charged as much as she did. She knew how long they took to tie. Mm -hmm. And uh, the people who were buying them and basically could afford them. <laughs> I move that a little bit. Oh yeah, just turn it. Well, cool. Um, yeah. And any questions? Uh, those we've got uh, seven people hanging in uh, online. Oh, yeah. Baxter Rhodes, George Roy, and Nancy. Uh, have any questions for Greg? Everybody's on mute. So you'll have to pull okay. up on mute if you want to ask a question you swing it or when you uh, the cheeks type it on the chat. You just swing it. Well, yep. How do you fish it? Troll it? Troll it. Troll it. Troll it. Swing it. Strip it. Anyway. All kinds of ways to fish. And you put the cheeks on. You were talking about 10 and 2. Is the idea that you want them to meet at the top, but kind of splay at the bottom? They will meet more at the top than at the bottom. Okay. Now, the one thing I didn't put on here, because I didn't bring anything with me, is a throat. Okay. Just putting on a, a, a schlappen throat okay. that fills in that space there. I didn't bring them along. So that, that would be one thing that's missing from... Uh, and you've stacked three of these feathers glued together pretty much. You know, two yep. two hackles and a, and a cheek. Two hackles and a cheek. And then... And you've got this situation and the hook is running here like you had a roll. Well, and you that... You resort to, to flattening sometimes if you can't you get... You just sort of squeeze them together. Ideally, all of them will be sitting up there like that. Okay. Ideally. And then glue <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, putting glue on it, but uh, yeah, it's uh, you, you're putting them on, and then you're squeezing them together. They they still they're still at kind of ten and two. Mm -hmm. It would be different if you put them together and put them right on top and tied them down. They'd all be together, right. and it would give you a totally different wing. Yeah, it would it would be up more cocked up. Yeah, I was just thinking about having three stems right next to the hook shank, and as, as you roll over, the, they're going to want to go like this, sure, right? Sure. The top one's going to want to go up or down, and the other two are going to come together. That's why when you right. when you put them on, you put a and few you, light wraps on, right? Just and you put the other one on a few light wraps. Then when you put them together a little bit, they'll kind of stay together, and then you're really cinching them down. Okay. The other thing that when Sharon did her uh, taking a part of the Blue Devil, the one thing she noticed also that I hadn't seen before was that the stems of the feathers were not completely cleaned. She was uh, actually, if these were the tips of the feathers, the feathers went right to the tips so that the thread coming around was actually grabbing the end, the ends of the of the feathers, mm -hmm. and uh, I hadn't seen that before either. So that that was very interesting when she did that. So you mean it was tying down, not just the stems. not just the stems, but actually the the fibers. like instead of tying it down here, yeah. it was actually tying it down up here, whether in the feathers. So the effect yeah, is you get three it, of these stems and then all the barbules kind of pack it. It would give you more to grab a hold of. Right? Yep, exactly. But but it's real easy when you're tying like that to get everything all just bunched together. And yeah, it's a little tougher. You have to be yeah, careful. Yeah. It makes a mess. And when I saw that, and she was also the one that, that she was sure when she took the fly apart, that the wings were tied in at the same time, mm -hmm. not separately. Right. And then it it made because I tried it. I tied one with the wings at the same time, mm -hmm. but I left it the way she did it. I didn't 
make the bare stem all the way to where I wanted to tie in. Mm -hmm. And I could see where if you were, especially if you weren't using a vise, and you were holding onto the hook, and you were putting those wings on the front there with your fingers, and then you were wrapping thread around them, it would, I think, work a lot better leaving those feathers on there, that you were actually tying down feathers, not just stems. I can't imagine holding that hook and holding two oh, I know. sets of feathers out at the same time and then oh, I know. trying to get by them all hand. lined up. By I hand? Oh. oh, by hand. I did hand. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, That's some dexterity. I've tried it, and it's no fun. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. But it, it made sense since I said she, she said she never saw anybody tie a fly. She didn't know anything about fly tying. So it wasn't like she felt she was missing something, like, oh, well, I should be using a vice. She didn't know what a vice was because supposedly all they did was ask her, you ought to try fly tying. They never really told her anything about how to do it. So she looked at a fly and she said, well, let's see. It looks like uh, there's some uh, floss wrapped around the body there and some tinsel. And I mean, she had to kind of figure it all out. So it's quite amazing. But then she came up with her own techniques, all this gluing the feathers together and all of that because it made it, I think, easier to tie the finished product. Mm -hmm. Do you think that you said that she made hats and such, that right. those kind of techniques would be used? Absolutely. Made hats? I'm yeah. sure they glued all those feathers together when they made hats. I know they did. So, yeah, that's, that would have come to mind to her right away. Well, if I'm going to put all these feathers on a hook, I'm going to glue them on, because that's what I would do if I was making a hat. Sure. Yep. So, cool. I guess uh, that's it. What kind of, boy, I don't have it. They're going to throw us out of here soon. By the people online, anybody have any further questions? Anything else? Suggest is I'll end the Zoom call. That'll and if we can have a beer and chat through. And so, thank you, everybody uh, online. Yeah, Baxter. Thank you Richard, very much. And. Uh, and Nancy, uh, and uh, we'll see you next month uh, when we have Jack Littleton talking about cartridge. And I'm going to end the call. I got to make that meeting. Carp fishing. I just fascinate.